The slowdown in China's economy has been dominating the business headlines recently. So in this video, I'd like to discuss why this slowdown is inevitable. China's economic growth model of export-led and investment-driven growth is in crisis. China's ex enjoyed extraordinarily rapid economic growth in recent decades, averaging almost 10% a year since 1990. And that growth has been driven by exporting. Exports grew by an average of 18% a year from 1990. And the United States has been China's main export market. In this chart, you can see that China's exports to the United States have now risen to $440 billion, whereas China's imports from the United States only amount to $120 billion. Consequently, China now has a $320 billion a year trade surplus with the United States. Back in 1985, there was no trade surplus. China was still a Cold War enemy with the United States. But since that time, trade surplus has expanded to now almost a third of a trillion dollars every year. And it's this extraordinary trade surplus that has transformed China's economy from a very poor third world country as recently as 1990 to now being the second largest economy in the world. <clears throat> this chart shows China's total exports and imports of goods and services. As China's exports grew, it had more money. So it was able to import more as well. So consequently, China has become the second engine of global economic growth. Now, however, with the US, Europe, and Japan in crisis, there's no one left for China to export to. World trade, you can see here, has slowed down very sharply. And making matters worse is the yuan's appreciation. China's currency was devalued very sharply in 1994, and then it was flat for quite a long time, but in 2005 it started to appreciate. And since then, it's risen by 35% against the dollar. And this currency appreciation is making Chinese goods much less competitive in the global market and making it more difficult for China to grow through export-led growth. Now, in order for China to grow through exporting, it was necessary for China to invest, to build factories, plant, and equipment. That's what we see in this chart of gross fixed capital formation. In other words, investment in US dollars. Now, this has now increased, China's investment has increased to almost $4 trillion a year as of 2012. And the, this chart shows the annual increase in dollar terms in investment. In 2011, the increase in China's investment was $600 billion and $500 billion more in 2012. So over the last five years, this we can say has averaged roughly half a trillion dollars growth per year. And here we can see the, the growth rate in investment. It's averaged 13% a year on average since 1990. This chart shows the increase in household consumption every year since 1990. It has averaged 8% a year. And when we compare these two, the growth in investment with the growth in household consumption expenditure, well, very clearly, investment has been considerably larger than the growth in consumption each year. And this has brought about a very unusual situation. China invests a much larger portion of its GDP than the rest of the world does. In this chart, what we see is 
investment as a percent of GDP in China, in the world, and in the U.S. So in China, almost 50% of GDP is made up of investment, whereas the world average is 23%. And the average in the United States now is just 15%. The U.S., out of total GDP, U.S. investment is only 15%, whereas in China, it's almost 50%. Now take a look at consumption in the U.S., the world, and China. Consumption as a percent of GDP. In the United States, consumption makes up 71% of GDP. The world average is 58%, but in China, it's only 35%. Now, in this chart, we see China's share of world GDP, investment, and consumption. China's GDP makes up 8% of global GDP, but its investment makes up 17% of world investment. On the other hand, its consumption only makes up 5% of world consumption. So very clearly, with China investing so much more than the world average and consuming so much less than the world average, that makes China very dependent on exporting to the rest of the world. Now here we see investment and household consumption expenditure in billions of dollars. And the ratio between the two, investment is becoming a larger share. And this chart shows the gap between the two. As of 2012, the gap between the amount that China invests and the amount that it consumes through household consumption expenditure had grown to more than $800 billion, up from roughly, it was flat as recently as 2004. Now, if we project these numbers out to the year 2020, using the average growth rates since 1990, this is what we see. The gap between, be, between them becomes very much larger. And here you can see that gap. By 2020, the gap between investment and household consumption expenditure, if it keeps growing at current rates, will be four and a half trillion dollars. So the Chinese leaders have told the world that they intend to shift China's economy from being export-led and investment-driven to being consumer-led. But really, that's just not going to be possible. Today's consumption in China results from wages earned in factory jobs in the export sector. Higher consumption requires higher wages, but higher wages would push the factory jobs to lower wage countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. The problem in China is that 80% of the people earn less than $10 a day. So these people can't afford to buy the things that they're making in the factories where they work. Now with the U.S. economy in crisis, the United States can't afford to buy more Chinese goods, and the Europeans and the Japanese can't afford to buy any more Chinese goods. So why should China continue to invest more and more each year and create even more excess capacity? Because there's already extreme excess capacity in almost every industry in China. China's government has responded to this slowdown in world trade and the slowdown in China's export growth by allowing Chinese banks to radically expand lending. Since the crisis started, bank loans in China have increased by 144%. Now, this is stimulating the economy in the short run, but it's almost certain to lead to a new systemic banking sector crisis in the future when these loans can't be repaid.
This chart shows China's GDP relative to the U.S. GDP. In 1990, China's economy was only 6% the size of the U.S. economy. It's now grown to be more than 50% of the U.S. economy in size. This chart shows the same thing for Japan. In 1970, Japan's economy was only 20% the size of the U.S. economy. But then, through the great Japanese boom and bubble, it rose to be more than 70% the size. But then the bubble popped, and the economy became stopped growing. And in fact, relative to the size of the U.S. economy, it shrank back to 30%. I think it's quite possible that something very similar is going to happen to China's economy. It's very unlikely that China's economy is going to become the largest economy in the world. When Japan's bubble popped, Japanese policymakers were able to prevent Japan from collapsing into a depression by running very large budget deficits every year for the last 24 years. And as a result, Japan's government debt has increased from roughly 60% of GDP in 1990 when the bubble popped to now almost 250% of government GDP, of, of total GDP. Something similar is probably going to have to occur in, in China. China's government debt now is roughly 23% of China's GDP. In order to keep China's economy from contracting, and perhaps contracting very sharply. I believe it's going to be necessary for China's government to start running very large budget deficits. And this is going to result in China's government debt climbing very sharply over the next decade. And in that way, China should be able to avoid collapsing into a depression. But they're not going to be able to achieve anywhere near 7% GDP growth that way. So China's great economic boom is coming to an end. The gap between investment and consumption has become too large, and the global economy can no longer absorb China's excess production. So I expect China's growth rate to average something like 3% a year over the next 10 years, not 7% as the consensus currently expects. What are the implications of this? Well, the global economy is going to slow, and corporate profits are going to weaken. Commodity prices are going to fall further. And less growth in the commodity producing countries like Australia, Brazil, and Canada will be the result of falling commodity prices. And as a result of weaker growth, there'll be downward pressure on those currencies. Also, we can expect greater global deflationary pressures and low interest rates well into the future. The yuan could fall, perhaps significantly. Its appreciation is no longer a sure bet. Globally, political tensions may rise. And finally, more monetary stimulus through additional fiat money creation is very likely on a global scale.